All right, let's take a look at how some genetics can cause some diseases, and let's talk about a few disorders. Uh, first, we're going to talk about sickle cell disease. Um, sickle cell disease is caused by a codominant characteristic, and it affects the protein hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein that's in your blood cells, and it's what carries oxygen. So there are two alleles for hemoglobin. Uh, there is hemoglobin A. This is a weird one because we use two letters for it, but HB just is short for hemoglobin. And, whoops, let's not have that one in there. And then there's hemoglobin S. And these are codominant, so those are both capital letters. Um, this is the code for the changed hemoglobin protein. And HBA is our genotype code for the normal hemoglobin. Uh, there's a couple kinds of individuals. There is an individual with H... Ah, I wrote that wrong. All right, HBA, HBA. This individual makes normal circular red blood cells. Um, they don't indicate, they don't have any of those sickle cell characteristics like uh, they don't have anemia, the blood cells don't block up their blood vessels. However, there's a benefit to having some characteristic of sickle cell, and that is that you can't get malaria. So this person here with no sickle cell traits is highly susceptible to malaria. Not a great thing. Um, there's a heterozygous person who has one copy of the HBA allele and one copy of the HBS allele. And this person makes normal red blood cells, the same as otherwise. Um, they get a mild anemia because their proteins show some of the characteristics, but not all of the characteristics. Because remember, this is codominance. And codominance means that these are both dominant alleles, so they're both represented. Um, luckily, there's enough of the normal protein that it's not a huge issue. And um, these people have a better resistance to malaria. I don't know if it means they're completely immune to it or if it just means that they're really resistant. And then we have these individuals here that have full sickle cell anemia. Anemia is a reduction in blood vessels, I'm sorry, in blood cells that can carry oxygen. And these proteins don't carry oxygen very well at all. So I want you to imagine a normal sickle, I'm sorry, a normal hemoglobin protein that looks a lot like this, just some kind of blob over here. And then a sickle cell protein looks a lot like this. And the problem with the sickle cell protein is that these areas here are kind of open and sticky. And so as a result, when they come into contact with another hemoglobin protein, they latch onto it. And because they've latched onto it, it forms this stretched out shape, which makes the red blood cell stretch out into a long kind of crescent shape. And that's the sickle shape that they talk about in the sickle cell. Um, this person has really bad anemia. They don't carry a lot of oxygen in their red blood cells. They run out of breath easily. Um, unfortunately, these people can also get malaria. And so it's kind of the double bad whammy. All right. That's sickle cell disease. Once again, it's caused by codominant alleles, which I just realized I spelled wrong. Those are codominant alleles. All right, let's move on to our next disease, which is cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is a completely dominant characteristic, complete dominance characteristic, which means we've only got two alleles. We've only got two alleles, and um, one of those causes the disease, one of them doesn't. So we will call them big F for a normal 
CFTR protein, and little f for a mutated CFTR protein. All right. So how does cystic fibrosis work? Well, let's imagine your alveoli. Right here at the end of a bronchiole, and your alveoli are covered in a layer of mucus that is that is nice. It helps protect. Uh, it helps uh, uh, keep bacteria stuck to it, so you can get rid of it, get rid of the bacteria. It, it um, provides a liquid surface for oxygen to pass through, and so on and so forth. Now, if we zoom in on these cells here, here's one type one pneumocyte, here's another type one pneumocyte, and these cells have little proteins in them that allow chlorine to pass through the membrane. This is normal. Um, if you have cystic fibrosis, you don't make working versions of these proteins. And as a result, the chlorine can't stick in there. I'm sorry, can't pass through the membrane. So instead, what you get are cells that build up a whole bunch of chlorine inside of them. Because they have a lot of chlorine in them, they have a lower concentration of water inside. There's a higher concentration of water outside, and the water wants to come inside the cell. Unfortunately, you've got this mucus out here, and when you take that water away, that mucus becomes really thick. You have trouble breathing. This mucus, if we're talking about other tubes, like let's say your vas deferens that also needs to have mucus can get all clogged up so sperm can't pass through them. If we're talking about your pancreas, and your pancreas helps get um, digestive enzymes into your small intestine, that mucus clogs it up, and those digestive enzymes can't pass through. It causes all kinds of problems. A lot of advances in, in some technologies have helped people with cystic fibrosis live into their 30s and 40s now, but it used to be that they would die in their early 20s. Um, so since this is passed on kind of like how we're used to, big F is normal, little f is uh, mutated, we have big F, big F people, which are normal proteins. We have big F, little f people, which are carriers of the cystic fibrosis protein. And then we have little f, little f people who have full-blown cystic fibrosis. So these are passed on normally. All right, let's talk about our last disease. Our last disease is called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is pretty dangerous, um, but it doesn't come into effect. Uh, you don't see it until you're about 30 to 50 years old, at which point you've probably had kids already, and you might have passed on this allele. It's pretty bad. Um, once you get it, uh, you're only going to live for about 20 years after that causes a lot of uh, brain degeneration and you eventually need full nursing care and all kinds of problems. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty dangerous one. Uh, more common in Europe than in anywhere else in the world. Now this one's really interesting because uh, while it works on complete dominance, it, it, it's, a, a, it's a little bizarre because it's the big H, it's the dominant allele that causes the disease. And so the opposite of sickle cell, I'm sorry, the opposite of cystic fibrosis, it's the dominant allele that causes the disease. And so lowercase people don't have it, people that have the recessive characteristics. So we have big H, big H people, which are uh, incredibly rare because you'd have to have both parents have it. And it's already a little bit rare. It's just more common. And you have little h, little h people. And little h, little h people have the Huntington's disease. And they are called carriers. No, they're not called carriers. They have the disease. And little h, little h people and little h, little h people are normal and don't carry the disease at all.
Should have labeled that Big H, Big H also leads to Huntington's disease. Let's erase my little squiggles there. All right. And so this Punnett square would look in a, in a, in a normal way. So if you have a father, let's say, with Big H, Little H, he has Huntington's disease, unknowingly passed it on to his kids because it doesn't get noticed until later. And let's imagine a normal mother, Little H, Little H. So we do our normal Punnett square here. And then we have two possibilities of passing on the Huntington's disease allele. And we have two possibilities of not passing it on which means there's a 50% chance that you would pass on that Huntington's disease allele to your children. So you need to know these three diseases and how they get passed on. Thanks for listening.